Good morning, Riverside Church. And good morning to Riverside Church Online. Father, we just pray today that you would have your way in this place and that you would move. Father, let your presence fill this house and let your presence fill everybody's house who is watching online today as we worship you and as we praise you, as we lift you up. We love you, Lord. Wonderful. And uh, welcome if you're joining us this morning. It's great to have you with us. Good to see some friends who haven't been here for a couple of years. It's good to have you here again. <laughs> hey, uh, we're going through the Bible chronologically, and uh, this is the new reading from April through to April, May, and June. So there is a stack down the back there, so help yourself to those. That would be great. And uh, continuing on, it's really interesting reading, you know, the Bible chronologically so you can get it, you know, in that right order how it happened. This morning's reading was about uh, uh, Joshua and uh, in, that, in the book of Joshua, it talks about Caleb. And I love what Caleb said. I was journaling on the, this, this verse this morning and Caleb said, I'm 85 years old. And he says, I can still travel and I can still fight. And I want the land that's mine. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. 85 years old. Because they had all died out, you know, over uh, under the age of 40. And I thought, wow, I want to be like Caleb. Able to travel and able to fight. Amen. Able to travel, preach the gospel and fight the good fight. That's what I thought was fantastic. So grab those journaling cards. That would be wonderful. Now, uh, some announcements for you. We're doing an I Am series, and the I Am is speaking about all the things that Jesus went through. We've gone through quite a few, and we're coming up to Easter. And that gives us, it gives us an insight of what Jesus went through, because we go through similar things, not to the same degree, but we can go through them. And he is our high, sympathetic high priest. So I'm really looking forward to the word this morning from Pastor Randall. Uh, mums and bubs. Mums and bubs are now on every Friday from 10 a.m. So you maybe know of uh, friends who've got uh, mums at home with bubs. They come in here, they just go into the room and they hang out and they talk about mums and all the bubs have a good time crying and doing all the wonderful things that bubs do. Pre-service prayer meetings here uh, every Sunday morning at 8.30. Come and join us. There was, uh, you know, I think well over 10, 12, 15 people here this morning praying and seeking God. So it's a great time of prayer. So I encourage you to get involved in praying because prayer changes things. Yes? Amen. And connect groups. And we're going through the Bible uh, in different parts. I think it's so important that we understand the context of the Bible, that we get the whole big picture. So if you'd like to be involved in a connect group, please come and see me after the service. And a big thank you to those who have uh, given to Riverside Community Care so we can create care packages for our community. And you may know of someone in our community or a friend who would really appreciate a care package. Please see Ray and Sally. They're heading up the community care. And uh, it's just such a great, great thing to do to bless other people. And there are several ways to give. You can do that by direct debit an FPOS machine, and there's a cash offering there. Or you can use the Tidely app. And thank you for your continued, continued support. It's wonderful, and the blessing of God is there. For those who sow, therefore they can reap. And follow us on Facebook. Go back there, see all the different types of messages we've had. I'm sure you'll be inspired by those. Good morning, everyone. How are we going? Good. Who can believe that it is almost the end of March? It is almost a quarter of the way through the year in 2023. That's pretty crazy. Uh, last week is, this week is the last week of term for term one. So my daughter has finished the uh, first, uh, first term of year seven, which is pretty exciting for Haley. And uh, Charlie's finished term of year nine. So she's ending her junior school. She'll be in senior school next year, year 10. And for those who didn't know, so I can embarrass my daughter even more, last, was it Friday, on Friday, my daughter sang in front of uh, a large part of 
150 to 200 people. So she sang with some friends of hers. So that was pretty cool. That's why I'm embarrassed. I'll post the video later on Facebook so you can I'll post for yourself. <laughs> Wait for yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, my job embarrassing my daughter is over. I won't do it anymore, I promise. <laughs> so yeah, but we, are, we are a quarter of the way through. Uh, we have been, uh, over the month of uh, March, been going through uh, seven pivotal moments in the life of Christ leading up to the resurrection. And this is talk number four. I encourage you to go back on YouTube and look at those uh, sermons if you haven't heard them. And uh, this morning I'm talking about um, carrying my cross, carrying the cross. And so last week Penn, Ken talked about uh, the pain of Jesus. Jesus suffered, I'm in pain, and the suffering he did for us, but also the suffering that led to his own glory. So I encourage you to listen to that sermon as well. But this morning, I want to zero in on a very specific event that happens to Jesus. It's very short. It's only one verse in, in the Bible, in three of the Gospels. And it's one verse. I want to zero in on this very specific thing that happens to Jesus. And it's, I'm reading from the book of Luke this morning. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John doesn't cover this because his gospel was a bit different, as we know. So Luke 23, verse 26, and it says this. As they led Jesus away... A man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that is living and active. We thank you, Lord, that even though we can read your word a thousand times, you will speak to us something new, have fresh revelation. Holy Spirit, you will come and you will open our eyes to see something we had not seen before. So I pray, Lord, that you would open your word to us this morning. Everyone here, as they're sitting here listening, they would ask, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me this morning, that I may glorify your name and live for you? Lord, bless us this morning as we look at your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So look at this event. Uh, it could be considered seemingly unimportant. You might, you might gloss over it in the whole event of Jesus being uh, arrested and betrayed and denied and then beaten and flogged and then let out, and then crucified, you might overlook this verse. But it is in fact a, a powerful meeting between two men who are heading in opposite directions in their life. They're meeting at a junction in their life, and it's a powerful meeting that means a lot if we take the time. So in this verse, we have two men on two journeys. Two men on two journeys. And we'll start with Jesus because that's the one we're most familiar with. So we've been chronicling the life of Jesus, starting with about the Last Supper. Uh, Judas leaves, and he goes to betray Jesus. And then we have Jesus and the 11 disciples, and they head out to the Mount of Olives. They're in the garden, and they come out. And here's Judas leading the angry horde of men with, who are armed, and they come and seize Jesus. And then Jesus is taken to the high priest's house, and he is interrogated. It's a sham. It's a, it's a false trial. He's accused of things he hasn't done. And in the courtyard, we see that Peter denies Jesus. He denies him three times. Peter rejects having any association with Jesus. And then Jesus goes on to go to more trials as an angry mob. And then Pilate, Pontius Pilate, washes his hands and he hands Jesus over. He says, I'm done with this. This is not my responsibility anymore. And he hands Jesus over. And Jesus face, faces uh, whipping, flogging. He is tortured. He is beaten. And now we have a bloody and beaten Jesus, forced to carry the cross, the beam on his back, out to Golgotha to be crucified. That's Jesus' journey. Jesus is being led out to be crucified. That's his journey, led out to be crucified. It's unlikely uh, despite artists' interpretations, that Jesus would have carried the entire cross on his back. A Roman crucifixion cross probably weighed about 130 kilos. So not many of, many of us could probably carry an entire cross on our back as long as Jesus had to carry it for it. So especially one if we've been whipped and beaten and we had raw wounds on our backs. So it's more likely that Jesus carried the beam, the cross beam of the cross. That's what he carried. And as Ken said last week, some people didn't even survive the whipping process. They didn't even make it to crucifixion because they died while they're being flogged. And so Jesus, uh, he survives, he endures that, and he's given the crossbeam to carry, which would have been about 40 to 50 kilos on its own. That's quite a bit of weight. And he stumbles through the streets. He's losing a lot of blood. He's struggling with the raw weight on his raw wounds. 
paraded through Jerusalem. People are spitting at him. They're mocking him. They're crying insults at him. They're laughing at him. Jesus is taking one drawn-out step after the other. He's willing himself on, knowing that he must do this. He must complete what God has set him to do. And he gets to the gate, and he stumbles, and maybe he even falls. The laughter of the crowd in his ears, and the weight of the wooden beam is suddenly gone. The beam has been taken off. The blessed release of pressure on his wounds, and the beam is given to another man. So that's Jesus' journey. On the same day that Jesus was rejected by his own, denied by those he loved, sentenced to death, and paraded out before people, there was another man. Another man was coming into Jerusalem, approaching the city after his own long journey. His name was Simon. What do we know about Simon? Unfortunately, not much. We know very little about Simon. We know he was from Cyrene. Now, Cyrene is the northwestern part of Libya, modern-day Libya, where Tripoli is now. So in Africa, northern Africa. And in Cyrene was a very large Jewish colony. A large Jewish settlement was there. So much so that one commentator remarks that the Cyrenian Jews had their own synagogue in Jerusalem. That was just for them. That's how many there were. That's how big the community was in Cyrene. And so the same year that Jesus died on the cross was the same year that Simon was going to fulfill a lifelong ambition. He was going to travel to Jerusalem and celebrate Passover in the holy city. The journey from Cyrene to Jerusalem is about 1,223 kilometers by boat. That's a long way. The boat was really the only way you could make the journey. You could go by land, but it was a little bit longer. But you have to travel all the way across Libya and all the way across Egypt. So some desert regions. It wasn't really practical to go that way. So you usually had to go by sea. The problem is that traveling by sea is expensive. It costs money. And so Simon would have spent considerable time working at his craft, whatever it was, and saving up, putting away what he could put away. Years spent saving money so he could finally, one day, he could go to Jerusalem, make his pilgrimage to the holy city to visit their very own synagogue, to, to experience the sight and sounds of Jerusalem at the height of the Passover festival. I mean, some would have grown up hearing the stories, how God had saved his people, how when the angel of the Lord passed over the Egyptian houses, the Israelites were saved. They had blood on the doorposts. God had saved his people. He would have grown up hearing that story many, many times, celebrating the Passover in Cyrene many, many times. He would remember sacrificing animals himself with his own family to celebrate Passover. And now Simon is finally able. He's finally able to go to Jerusalem, to see the temple, to hear and feel the crowd. And so he makes the trip. He hops on the boat and he travels to Jerusalem. And like a lot of pilgrims, he couldn't afford to stay in Jerusalem. It cost too much money. So he would have stayed in a village outside of the city and walked in every day. And so that morning he got up and he walked in. But today it wasn't like any other day. Simon didn't know that. Simon had no idea. He didn't know who Jesus was. Had no clue. He lives in Africa. Has no idea who Jesus is. He walks into the city, towards the city, comes to the gates and there's this crowd. There's this procession, a parade, coming out of the city as he's going into the city. It's chaos. There's yelling, there's jeering, there's taunts, there's laughing. There's a bloody figure who kind of looks like a man, but it's hard to tell. He's stumbling. He's having trouble walking. People are falling behind. People are pushing and they're shoving. And all of a sudden, when the crowd moves and throws, he comes face to face. Simon has a Roman soldier right in his face. And he's singled out from the crowd. Luke in the gospel uses the word seized. Simon was seized by the Roman guard. Matthew and Mark use a different word. They say he was forced. The word means compelled. Simon didn't have a choice, regardless of what word you use. If a Roman soldier told you to do something, you don't question him. You do what you're told. And so in one movement, Simon, having no idea what's going on, is singled out. And all of a sudden, this beam is placed upon his shoulders. 
and he's directed to follow that bloody figure stumbling out of the city. So Simon, as he was heading, he has to change direction and go out of the city just as he was about to get there. The destination he had waited so long to see, had saved up money so he could be here. All of a sudden, he has to go this way and follow Jesus, a man he doesn't even know. Simon woke up that morning in a village outside Jerusalem and set off so he could worship his God. That's what he wanted to worship his God. That's Simon's journey. Simon was on his way to worship. Jesus was on his way to be crucified, but Simon was on his way to worship. Two different destinations, two different directions, two men, two journeys. Simon just wanted to remember how God saved his people, how God covered them in sacrificial blood so the next generation could live. And now he's walking behind Jesus. The beam pressing on his shoulders. The blood of Jesus that was smeared is now soaking into his clothes, rubbing off on his shoulders and his neck. Someone would have heard all the insults pelted at Jesus. He would have heard what the crowd is saying. They're calling him the Messiah. This guy thinks he's the Messiah? The Messiah wouldn't be led out to be crucified. Not the Messiah that I was taught. Who does this man think he is? Simon came for the Passover, and it's Jesus being led out like the sacrificial lamb. As they made their way to Golgotha, the place of the skull, Simon can put the beam down finally, and he stands back. He becomes part of the crowd, an eyewitness to the crucifixion of Christ, standing there, covered in the blood of Jesus, wondering, how did this happen? How did I come to play a role in this man's death? Two men, two very different journeys. This was no ordinary day, not for Jesus, not for Simon, and certainly not for us. When we talk about carrying our cross, or that we have a cross to bear, it means different things to different people. If I said that to you, you have a cross to bear, you'll have different images in your mind. When we hear that phrase, it's just my cross to bear, I think people generally think of a burden they have to carry. They have this thing in their life that they are forced to carry around with them. That they are completely responsible for this thing. If they didn't do this thing, then it wouldn't get done. I've got to carry it around. I remember when I first heard the idea of carrying a cross, or having a cross to bear. It was back in the 90s. And uh, when I was in high school, and there was a singer named Alana Smorissette. Who's ever heard of Alana Smorissette before? Okay. She brought out an album called Jagged Little Pill. And it was all angsty and brooding and raw emotional stuff. The girls in my year level loved it. They loved this album. They loved Alanis Morissette. And the, the, the big single from that song was a song called You Ought to Know. And it was about relationship breakdown, boy dumps girl, boy moves on to new girl. Old girl is left with these feelings of rejection and betrayal. He doesn't want to deal with that anymore. He's moved on. And it talks about how she's carrying around these feelings now. They've become part of her. And the line of the song goes this, It's not fair to deny me of the cross I bear that you gave to me. That's the song. Who's heard that line before? We've heard that song before. Yeah. When I first heard this song, I'm not the only one, I thought the line was, It's not fair to deny me the cross-eyed bear that you gave to me. And I was thinking, who would give someone a cross-eyed bear? That's a weird gift. Why would you give someone a cross-eyed bear? Like, why? And then he's denying her the gift, so he's keeping it. What a jerk. The guy's not very nice. You're better off without him. It's okay. I wasn't the only one. You laugh, but I wasn't the, I know I wasn't the only one. The cross I bear. I did figure out there was a cross I bear. I didn't figure it out. And then I figured out at a young age that people do this, that we do this. We carry around these crosses that we think we are forced to bear. These big emotions, betrayal, rejection, unrequited love, pain, dreams, needs, that we think we have to bear. But these burdens could be anything. It could be physical pain. Doctors say they can't do anything else and just have to live this way now. It becomes the thing you have to carry around. That's just the way I am now. Or it could be a responsibility you have. I have to look after this person. There's no one else to look after them. I have to do it. 
I've got to take care of these people. That's your cross to bear. The thing is, though, this is the most important thing, is that if we carry them around, they become part of us. We begin to identify with the burdens that we carry. They become part of how we see ourselves. They don't become just the cross that we bear. They become us. That is how we view ourselves now. We are defined by our burdens. But that is not what God wants. He doesn't want you to live your life thinking that you are identified by the stuff that you carry around. No. In the book of Matthew, verse 16, chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says this to his disciples. That's quite a famous verse. He says, says to his disciples, if anyone wants you to be my follower, you must give up your own way, taking up your cross and follow me. It would be a mistake for us to think that Jesus meant by taking up their cross, our cross, it was to put up with some burden for the sake of Jesus. That would be a mistake. That we would deny ourselves the, the chance to deal with the things that we carry around, to, to process them, to let them go, but we carry them around because somehow following Jesus means ignoring and not dealing with the raw emotional stuff. That's not what Jesus wants. We think we have to stay burdened with life's challenges to follow Jesus? No. No. That's not what Jesus is saying. In this verse it says, take up their cross. Take up your cross, it says. In the King James it says, take up his cross. His cross. It's the word autos. The word autos. And it's used as a pronoun in most of the Bible. But it also means same. So, you must give up your own way taking up the same cross and follow me. The same cross as what cross? Whose cross? The cross of Jesus. You must give up your own way, taking up the cross of Jesus and follow me. That's what Jesus is saying. Take my cross and follow me. We are to take up the cross of Jesus instead of our own cross. We are meant to take our cross or the crosses that we bear and give them to Jesus. And then take up his cross. We're only supposed to carry one cross. Only one. We cannot carry our crosses and then expect to take up the cross of Jesus as well. We can't do that. We can't carry them all. We're just not, it's just not possible. We can't do it. So we have to give over our crosses to Jesus and then take up his cross. We let go of the things we identify with and... We identify with Christ instead. That's what Jesus is saying. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says this. It says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So we're meant to give over our worries and cares. We're called to exchange our cross for a better cross. The problem is we get so used to carrying our crosses that we don't notice them anymore. It's just who we are now. It's what we do. We don't feel the weight anymore until one day it all comes crashing down. One day we try and take them up and they're too heavy for us. But they weren't too heavy yesterday. We can't carry them forever. We just aren't able. And so we're meant to come to God and exchange the stuff that we carry around and take up a better cross. That's the choice. That's the choice for us. If you are willing to lay down the crosses that you bear, or the crosses you've been carrying for so long you don't even notice them, and you're willing to take up the cross of Jesus, before you make the choice, there are three things you need to know. There are three things you need to know. The first one is this. Jesus' cross is lighter and eternal. His cross is lighter than our cross, and his cross lasts forever. It's eternal. So we have the choice. We can continue to carry our crosses, as we always have done, or we can choose to carry the cross of Jesus. Remember, you can only carry one. 
Do you choose to carry your cross of burdens, of problems, of needs, of dreams, of plans? Or do you carry the cross of Jesus, which is hope and life, blessing, peace and salvation? In Luke's gospel, we see the choices played out to make it easy for us to understand. It's played out between two sisters. Two sisters demonstrate for us the choice and what Jesus says in response. Turn with me to Luke 10, verse 38. You'll recognize these two women. They're quite famous. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was attracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I'll do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and will not be taken away from her. I think these are familiar to us. You know these verses. You know this story. I've heard it preached about I've heard people talk about it, give their opinions on it. But what I find, I think, is a lot of people misunderstand what's happening in these verses. I think they misunderstand Jesus' response. I think people think that Jesus sometimes is being a bit harsh with Martha, that her concerns aren't valid. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think Jesus is being harsh with Martha. I don't think he's rebuking her in any way at all. In this version, it says, my dear Martha. But if you look at other versions, it says, Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha. The use of the double name is not an indication of exasperation or being frustrated like I do with my children. Charlie, Charlie. I don't do that. But for, in the Bible, in the word of God, the use of the double name is not frustration. It's intimacy. You think about it. Abraham, Abraham. You think about it. Jacob, Jacob. Moses, Moses. Samuel, Samuel. Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? It's intimate. What God is trying to do is say, I need you to pay attention to me because I'm trying to teach you something. I'm not angry with you. I'm not mad at you. I just need you to listen for a second. I want you to understand. Martha, Martha, I get it. I get it. I came into your house. I brought all these people with me. Now you've got all these people in your house and you've got to feed them all. I get it, Martha. Jesus understands. He's, I get it. It's not fair of me to turn up and invite all these people that's following me. There's so many people here that don't even fit in the door. They're waiting outside because they can't fit in your house. And you're rushing around trying to figure out how you're going to feed all of them. I understand. But Martha, don't you understand who I am? Just a couple of chapters before this, Jesus fed the 5,000. 5,000 families, not 5,000 men, closer to a 15,000, 20,000 figure that he fed that day. The feeding of the 5,000. The same Jesus who fed the 5,000 is the same Jesus talking to Martha. Martha, Martha, don't you understand who I am? If my father can provide for all those families, if he needs to, he can feed all of these people. You don't need to be concerned. I am here. Mary has figured out what's important. It won't be taken away from her. Don't be concerned. If it needs to happen, it'll happen. Your cross is not unwarranted. Martha, your cross is not something that is, should be belittled or diminished. No, I understand your concerns. I get it. But I have a better cross for you. I have a better cross. So lay that one down and take up this one. It's the only cross that matters. In Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus said this, Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The burden of Jesus is light. His cross 
is light. In his cross you will find teaching. In his cross you will find rest for your souls. It is a better cross to bear. But what is the cross of Jesus? What did Jesus bear on his way out of the city on the day that he met Simon? What did he bear? He bore obedience. Obedience. That was the cross that Jesus had to bear. Following the will of the Father. Simon bore the cross of Jesus. Why? Because he was made to. The Roman soldier said, you, you carry the cross. He was obedient. To who? The Roman soldier. Because really, you don't get to protest against the Roman soldier. There was still obedience. That's because a different person carried the cross. Doesn't mean the cross changed. It was still obedience. And we must decide to carry the cross or not ourselves. Will we choose obedience? Will we lay our burdens down in exchange for his cross? Knowing that he'll carry our burdens for us, help us through them, will we take up the cross of obedience? Because the cross of obedience doesn't just allow us to lay down the weight of our crosses that we're already carrying, but it also leads us into eternal life. The crosses we carry don't lead anywhere. But his cross leads to eternity. You see, the cross of obedience saw Jesus become our sacrifice. So that if we choose a life of following Jesus, his sacrifice, his obedience, ensures our place in heaven. We become saved, redeemed, righteous. But the choice is ours. Our cross or his cross. So, his cross is lighter and it is eternal. Secondly, you have to know before you make a choice that carrying his cross has a cost. It has a cost. So the cross of obedience, while it is lighter, and while it does lead us into eternity, still has a cost for those who choose it. As Simon neared the gate, to enter Jerusalem, we know that a Roman soldier singled Simon out of the crowd. Why? Why did the soldier pick Simon? I don't know. I don't know why the soldier picked Simon. No idea. The Bible doesn't tell us why. Maybe it's because he saw Simon approach from a different direction. So he knew that he wasn't part of this chaotic crowd. He was someone outside of that crowd. And so he chose that guy because that guy was safer. Or maybe it was just simply proximity. At the very moment that Jesus stumbled, Simon just happened to be the closest guy. And so the soldier's like, you, carry, carry the cross. Or maybe, just maybe, it wasn't the soldier who chose Simon at all. Maybe it was God's divine plan that singled Simon out that day. I stated before in the Gospels that Matthew and Mark use a different word than Luke do to describe the moment that Simon has the cross put upon his shoulders. They use the word forced. It means the word compelled. He was compelled to carry the cross. And that word is only used three times in all of Scripture. It's the word angeruo, as your word lesson for the day, angeruo. And it means this. It means compelled to deliver a message. Isn't that amazing? It's only used three times in the Bible. It means compelled to deliver a message. A message. It means the dispatching of a courier to go deliver what you want them to deliver. This is your job now. You go do what I told you to do. When Simon took the weight of the beam, amidst the confusion, the chaos, the crowd, Simon, in that moment, becomes God's messenger. He was dispatched to deliver the message of the cross. What message? That Jesus bore the cross of obedience. So he, God could rescue his people. Here's the thing though. Simon had no idea what was going on. Not a clue. He did not know. He was not aware that from this moment on, his life would change forever. He got up that morning to come into Jerusalem and worship his God. Because God saved Simon's people. And now, he didn't even make it to the temple... He is now God's messenger, a witness to Jesus becoming a sacrifice so God could save his people. Simon didn't know it then, 
But he came to believe it later. I believe that Simon came to realize what had happened, what God had used him for. What happens to Simon after this day is, is up for debate. Uh, there is little evidence and it's not conclusive. But if I show you what we know, you can decide for yourself. How about that? You can make your own decision. Acts 11 verse 20. It says this, However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. So this happens after Peter, you know Peter? He went to Cornelius' house and he was the first one to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And the next chapter we have a group of believers from Cyprus and Cyrene sharing the gospel with Gentiles, not Jews, Gentiles. Antioch is the third largest city at the time, huge city. And the believers are preaching to anyone who will listen, anyone. And they're from Cyprus and Cyrene. Where was Simon from? Where was Simon from? Cyrene. When Simon departed from Cyrene to go to Jerusalem, to his lifelong dream, there was a huge Jewish contingency in Cyrene. Now in Acts 11, all of a sudden, there's Christians in Cyrene. How did that happen? These people have no idea who Jesus is. But one Cyrenian, Simon, who carried the cross of Jesus, and now we have Cyrenians declaring the gospel. What a coincidence. It's amazing. Acts 13, 11. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at the Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius from Cyrene, Manaen, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. I love the fact that the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas became a Christian, considering Herod's family and his record with Christianity is not so good, but his childhood friend became a Christian. I love that. But I love the verses. Now, some commentators believe that the Simeon in this verse is actually Simon, because it wasn't unknown of to be known by different names or similar names in the first century. Could it be Simon? Yes. Am I convinced it was Simon? No. Not 100%, but it could be. Happy to admit that. But that's not why I bring the verse up. I bring the verse up because of Lucius, because Lucius is from Cyrene. Where did he hear the gospel? Simon. It is my contention that Simon, on witnessing the events of Jesus' crucifixion, having carried the cross itself, returned to Cyrene a changed man. I believe that after the, Jesus was crucified, instead of spending the week celebrating the Passover like he'd always wanted to do, instead he went around and investigated who is this Jesus. He started asking people questions. He heard about miracles. He had heard all the stories, the things that Jesus did. This man they called the King of the Jews. And he was transformed. He was transformed by the events of that day and the things that he learned. And he traveled back to Cyrene and preached the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. You make your own mind up. That's what I believe. But what did it cost Simon? What was the cost? It cost him the entire life that he knew. That's what it cost him. He went from Judaism to following Jesus. He spent his whole life dreaming about going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And when he got there, what happened? He left not even believing what he believed when he got there. All his dreams, his desires and wants were put to the wayside because none of it mattered anymore. Because all that mattered was following Jesus. God called him out and he says, you're my messenger. If you would take up the cross of Jesus, go and tell what you saw here. And that's exactly what Simon did. He went and told people what he saw. A lifetime of beliefs, of traditions, of rituals, his dreams, gone. That was the cost. And Simon was more than willing to pay. He became pivotal to the work of the early church. Those were the men who commissioned Paul and Barnabas on the very first missionary journey. People from Cyrene. The cost for us is to lay aside those things that we bear. It's to deny ourselves 
and become his messenger, sharing the message of Jesus' cross, which is hope, life, peace, blessing, and salvation. So his cross is lighter. It's eternal. We know the cost. And thirdly, before you make your choice, you have to know that we aren't meant to carry the cross alone. We aren't meant to carry his cross alone. In his human form, because Jesus was fully human and fully God, Jesus needed help to bear his cross. The beam was heavy. And as tradition states, he would have had to have carried it about 650 metres. Or, there is contention of course, some say it's up to about a kilometre, depending on where you believe Herod Pilate was at that time. He was in a bad way. He was physically broken. Every step was torture. He'd been up all night. He was exhausted emotionally, mentally, physically. And he knew, he knew very soon that for the first time in his life, he would feel separation from his father, something he'd never experienced from the beginning of time. Before time was even a thing, he had never been separated from God. But he knew that was coming. He knew that God would have to turn his eyes away, that God would forsake him when he became sin. Jesus needed help. He needed help, and Simon was able to carry the physical burden of the cross so Jesus could make it to the place of the skull while still carrying the emotional, mental, and spiritual weight pressing in on him. If Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, if he needed help carrying his cross, why would we think that we can carry the same cross alone? Why would we think that? If Jesus needed help, then surely we aren't meant to do it on our own either. Galatians 6.2 says this. It says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. God couldn't be any clearer. We are supposed to share our burdens with each other. Taking up his cross means that we choose to be obedient, just as Jesus was. And the laying down of our cross, our burdens, those things that become to define us in order to carry his cross, isn't easy. That's not an easy thing to do. It's hard. But it's easier if we do it together. If we help each other lay our burdens down. If we're going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, obeying the standard he set for us, that is, obey the law of Christ, obeying the standard he set before us, if we're going to fulfill that pattern, we need to share our burdens. Because that's what Jesus did. He needed help, and so do we. He gave us the standard to help us carry his cross. And that is to do it together. If we choose his cross, if that's the choice that you make, then you're choosing to do it with other people. You cannot choose to do it and then do it on your own. No, because that's not what Jesus did. We are choosing to follow the standard he set for us. So if you make the choice to take up his cross, you are choosing to do it with other people. When we are tired, when we feel beaten, when we are wounded, when our dreams haven't come to pass, when things aren't the way we want them to be, we are meant to help each other back up again. We're meant to pray for one another, spur each other on, because as we carry the cross together, we remind each other that Jesus has already gone ahead of us. He is waiting for us. We help each other to look for him, to keep the faith, so we can finish the race together. So that's the choice we have. We have the choice to lay down our cross and take up his cross. When? Do we do it once? No, we do it daily. We daily take up his cross. It is something that we must choose to do every single day and in every single moment. It is not once and it's done. That's salvation. But to take up his cross and lay ours down is something that we must do every single day. And now you know what you need to know. 
His cross is lighter. It's eternal. It has a cost. And we're meant to do it together. And here's the last thing. Just so you have a little more information, the last thing you need to know is this, that God is with us. That just as we're not meant to do it alone, help each other, God doesn't call us to take up his cross without giving us the resources we need to do so. We are not alone. We are never abandoned. He chose us to take his message into the world. And so to do that, we have him with us, always. You are his, and he is our God. Isaiah 41, verse 9 says this. He says, I have called you back from the ends of the earth. So it doesn't matter where you're from or what you've done or how far away you feel from God. It doesn't matter the amount of burdens you've carried, what they are. It doesn't matter because God has called you back from everywhere, from every situation. I have called you back saying, you are my servant. For I have chosen you and will not throw you away. He will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. So that's the choice. Will you take up your cross, take up his cross and lay your cross down? Will you lay down at his feet the things that you've been carrying around, the crosses that you think you have to bear and take up his cross. That's the choice we have this morning. I can ask musicians if they would come this morning. And so we have a choice to make. We sang this morning that we're meant to make room for God. Well, now's your chance. Now's your opportunity to say to God, here is my choice. I will either choose to continue to carry my crosses because that's what I've always done or I will choose to take up your cross because I know I can only carry one. What's it going to be? The band's going to come. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. Stand and I want every eye closed and every head bowed. And you have an opportunity this morning. Just you and God. Because it's about you and God. Every person has a choice to make. Will you choose the cross of Jesus? Or will you continue to carry the cross of your own? Because whatever cross you choose, that will become your identity. That will become to define you. And God doesn't want anybody here, anybody watching at home, to be defined by the burdens that they carry. Those things that have happened to you, they don't define you. The responsibilities you think you have, they aren't who you are. They're just something that you do. They don't define you. The only thing that should define you is that you belong to Jesus. That you are his and he is our God. That is our defining characteristic. We are his and he is our God. I ask you to bow your heads this morning. I'm going to give you the moment this morning now. As the band begins to play. I'm going to ask you this morning. Are you willing to daily let your burdens down, lay your cross at the foot of Jesus and take up his cross? His cross. Are you willing to lay down the things that have come to define you, identify you? And are you willing to take up a new identity in Jesus? You could have been a Christian for your whole life, but you still carry around stuff you shouldn't carry around. God wants you this morning to say, I choose daily to take up your cross, to align myself with you, Lord, to identify myself with you. If that's you this morning, no one's looking around. I want you to raise your hand to God this morning. If you're willing to make that choice, if you're willing to choose to take up his cross 
and declare that I am his and he is my God and let those things go, the stuff that has identified you for so long, if that's you this morning, you can raise your hand to God this morning and make a commitment to him, a commitment to him and say, God, I daily would take up my cross because I understand what I'm doing. I understand that your cross is lighter. I understand that there is a cost and I'm willing to pay it. I understand that I will do it together with those you love and who love you. That's you this morning. Just raise your hand to God this morning. Make that commitment for him. That's you and him. Make that commitment. At home, if you're watching this morning, just raise your hand. Make a commitment this morning. Just a sign to say, God, I am going to take up my cross and follow you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we pray this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he was willing to carry the cross of obedience. That he endured what he had to endure so that we could be saved. So that we could be called children of God. So we could be made righteous before your eyes. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the cross that he bore. Lord, this morning I pray for everyone here, myself included. I pray, Lord, we would understand that we are not defined by the things that have been done to us. We are defined by the things that have been done for us. And you saved us, God. You saved us. You saved us, God. I pray, Lord, for everyone, every hand raised this morning. I pray, Lord, that everyone here, that they will make the choice. That as they go out of their homes, as they, as they rise from their beds every morning, they would say, Lord, I lay down my cross at your feet. And I take up your cross. I will be obedient to you. And I will share your message of hope and life and peace and blessing and salvation wherever I go. Because that is the cross that I bear. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that everyone here, everyone in this room would know that they are loved by you. That you are their God and they can call you their own that they would identify themselves with you and nothing else. Nothing that has been done to them or they've done to anyone else. All of that stuff was now to the cross with Jesus. We have a new cross now. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Let us step out of this place this morning, Lord, renewed because we know that you are with us. You never leave us that you never turn us aside, that you journey with us, as as you called us to be your messengers, every one person here called to be your messengers, that you equip us, you resource us, you go before us and you are with us. And as we step out of this place, that we would share the cross of Jesus with everyone who needs to know, everyone who has not yet laid their cross down and taken up your cross. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 You are God's messengers. Take his message out there. Hope, life, peace, blessing, salvation. He has gone before you and he is with you. You are his and he is your God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.